watching that live side. Happy Friday, everybody. We got there. Happy Friday. I cannot wait. Justin Shepard. I see you, Justin Shepard. All right, here's the thing, you guys. Okay, I got my dispatch headset on. Happy Friday, Justin Shepard. Woohoo! I got my headset on today. I'm I'm in serious mode. Um, we have new tech again. Uh, this time, I have to tell everybody something, um, especially to Andrew Teal. Uh, if anything goes wrong with the tech, this time it wasn't me. Literally, I have nothing to do with it. And I can see you. Hi, Rhonda. I saw your yoga yesterday. You killed it. Uh, Tim Pool's in the house. Laszlo. Oh, Laszlo shows up this time. So we're so excited to have you guys today. We have some special uh, folks joining us. And uh, I'm going to introduce them to you in just a minute. The freight coach is in the house. I hope that everybody's hiring him for broker training because he's amazing. His name is Chris Jolly, if you don't already know him. Uh, Jake, I see you. You're in the crowd too. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, new tech, new everything. Uh, I'm not doing anything, so I'm super excited about that. I can see your comments better. I'm excited about that too. Uh, here we go. We have today uh, OIDA, which is the big trucking organization. Huge. I've known about it my entire career. And they're going to come on. They're going to educate us about their initiative to get more visibility into shippers' rates. And it's so interesting. And I brought in Adam as well. He is the trucking expert. Uh, often you have seen Adam on this show quite a few times because I will admit, sometimes I lack the expertise that Adam brings to the table. So what else? Oh, OTR Capital. I got to introduce them again because they are my favorite factoring company. Uh, this is the one thing. I heard something recently about a factoring company and a broker getting together and sharing all their data. And it was a weird scenario. And I want you guys to know that I double checked with OTR Capital and they don't play games with your data. So to my carriers, to my shippers, to my brokers, they don't play games with you. They treat you like a family. They're in the comments. Say hello to OTR. In the description here, I put people that you can get in contact with. They take good care of you. They also have a lot of back office support, no hidden fees. That is why they are Madtropolis's favorite factoring company. So reach out to them. All right, let's get the party started. Let's bring on our guests and, and let them introduce themselves because they're all so amazing. Um, and Amanda Miller will escalate all of the questions to me. Um, and Amanda, I'm, I got you on Hangouts over here. I'm going to keep an eye on the questions that you have. So Amanda Miller is one of my favorite freight brokers from Alabama. And she is going to help us out today, escalating anybody's questions. So let's see. How do we bring the guests on and a little bit bigger? Thank you. I don't even have to do that, you guys. Isn't that so exciting? All right. <laughs> First person is Louie. Louie, can you introduce yourself? Because I'm not going to lie. You're already one of my favorite people. Um, and uh, and I think you're going to be a favorite at Mad Travel. Is my, Mike's already laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, Cassandra. I'm glad I'm somebody's favorite people. Usually I don't get that. <laughs> but I am Louis Pugh. I'm the executive vice president here at OIDA. Um, been in trucking pretty much my entire life. I uh, was a small business, uh, one truck, one trailer owner operator for 20 plus years. Um, actually trucking is all I've ever done. Been on the board of directors here at OIDA for uh, a little over 16 years now and been the executive vice president here in-house for two years. Could we give him any more titles, Mike? <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how long have you been? Wait, is it OOIDA or is it OIDA? Because I've been calling it OIDA. Maybe I'm wrong. Both. We, we okay. like our, pre our president, Todd, likes OOIDA, but we'll take whatever. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, uh, Mike, Mike, welcome to the show. Um, how, how do you know Louie? And oh. is he always this nice or does he have a, does he have a mean streak? Uh, yeah, yeah, he has a mean streak. I've seen it. Uh, thanks, Cassandra, for having us on. Uh, I've been uh, Mike Matusik. I'm on the government affairs team, work out of our headquarters with Louie, um, kind of oversee our DC office. Uh, on the legislative and regulatory side of things, I've been with the WIDA for almost seven years. My background before that is in, uh, in DC on Capitol Hill on, on the legislative side of things. 
um, works for a couple members of Congress in their personal office. And in the last two years, um, I was on the House Transportation Committee. So, uh, and then uh, from there, I, I moved out to the Midwest where my wife is from, and the rest is history. And that's when I met Louie, and my life changed forever for the better. For the better. <laughs> I, I feel it. like we're dating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Adam, welcome back. I'm so happy to have you here. For those rare folks who do not know you, could you introduce yourself? Glad to be back, Cassandra. And thank you for having me on board. I apologize for the uh, the background, but I just landed in uh, Atlanta today. So, uh, but I, I told myself I'd make sure I wouldn't miss this. But I'm Adam Wingfield. I'm the managing director of Innovative Logistics Group. We're a consulting services and carrier services firm versus out of North Carolina, right there in Charlotte. Uh, our focus is primarily on supporting small owner operators, small fleet owners, all the way up to moderate sized fleets on profitability, compliance and other things that keep them in business. Myself, I've been in trucking about 21 years now, uh, not as much, not as long as Louie, but uh, we span a couple of decades in the industry. I start off as a behind a wheel, blue knuckle, uh, grew up to a fleet owner and then became an executive over a, a couple of uh, projects too as well. So my industry experience about 21 years, I've seen the industry go from, from where it was to where it is now. Uh, and my, my goal is to really continue to help move the needle and bring change to the industry. The first time that I met Adam and started really following him, especially on Instagram, because he has a lot of really good educational material and shows on Instagram. Um, I will tell you guys that it was when the rates were really low uh, in our country and carriers were extremely angry. Uh, they were saying that brokers and shippers were taking advantage of them. And I remember that the one question I had on my show for many carriers that came on the show was how much does it cost to run a truck? Like how much is your absolute minimum so that if I see a broker or shipper paying that per mile, I know that that broker and shipper is going way too low. And it was surprising to me because there weren't a lot of people who could answer that question. And that's how I became acquainted, acquainted with Adam because he, I feel like that is part of your business, Adam, is that you teach people how to be more profitable with the way they run, run their business. And exactly. you kind of helped us break it down. But, but to my OIDA folks, what, what was your, what was going on in your world when the rates were that low and people were really angry? Um, Cause I know it was stressful time for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I agree with what you're saying. There's a lot of owner operators out there that don't know what their cost of operation is. I mean, that's some of the stuff that we work with, with our members through different programs, especially with our foundation. They do a lot of training. They have a lot of educational series out there to teach guys that. We also offer a thing called Truck to Success, which kind of takes a guy from being a company driver all the way to being his own motor carrier. That's a big part of it is learning your cost of operations and knowing what your cost per mile. Um, it's really surprising to people when we have these um, classes, when they – we because our foundation has pretty much the average of what a big carrier takes to operate and what the average small carrier. And there's a big difference between the two. And what like I always tell them, you need to try to get your numbers as close to that big carrier's numbers if you want to be profitable. Because even though there's a lot more small trucking companies out there than large trucking companies, the large trucking companies pretty much set the bar on freaking rates and what, how things work out here for sure. Huh. And as far as dealing with it and, you know, and the broker thing, I mean, I'm part of the reason we're on here, you know, we put the petition forth for the broker, you know, transparency bill, because that's a rule. It's a regulation. We can debate whether it should, it's, it's outdated or should be changed or whatever, but it is a regulation and guys see it. There's always been some rub, you know, especially in the last since deregulation between brokers and truckers and, you know, it's probably sometimes it's justified and sometimes it's not justified. But we see a lot of brokers who continue to be successful and gain more profits and, and do good with their shareholders. And we don't see that too much with small business carriers, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, we at OIDA try to preach to our members that, you know, brokers are you should use brokers to get yourself back or to find rate where you're not it's not you're in an area that's not your area we try to get our owner operators to understand you're better off to get your own customers deal with small shippers and stuff direct take the broker out of the equation a lot of times 
you know, again, use a broker for what they're for to get you out of an area where you don't have customers, you don't have freight. That makes sense. Um, could we go back to one thing that you had said? You said uh, that the, the, the actually the big carriers are the ones who set the rates. I think I heard that correctly. Um, a question came through from, from Andrew Teal, uh, and uh, it's a good one. It says, how do you define big versus small um, in our... Uh, in our industry, when you're when you're saying that they're the kind of the ones that govern the rates. Well, yeah, and I would say you know you're you're talking your great big carriers probably. What do you think, Mike? Five hundred or more. I'm not. I know we've got some research out there on where the bars are, but you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know how you want to look at. It. It depends on which side of spectrum. On. Lord, the large motor carriers. They've got the volume, they've got the trailers, they, you know, work on a different format than small business carriers. And for and when it comes to big shippers and big, you know, receivers and stuff like that, they're more they're more interested in talking to big carriers. That's where the little guys, you gotta find your niche, you gotta find that niche market. I mean, that's how I personally probably find that little niche that the big carriers can't do or don't wanna do or don't wanna mess with. Do you think that too, uh, Adam? Is that what you uh, preach to? So, uh, yes and no, um, because then the rejections have a big, a big impact on rates, right? So you know, if you look back just a couple of months ago, when there was a large carrier that I won't speak on that just didn't even have the capacity to fill out twenty thousand loads, so he spilled twenty thousand loads back out into the spot market. And obviously, when you got that many loads in the spot market, that's going to impact rates. But when we mm -hmm. talk about rates, rates are rates are driven by just straight tender rejections you know when you got contract tender rejections and you got folks rejecting those contracts on a contract market and the larger carriers can't facilitate capacity then it spills over to the spot market when it spills over into the spot market that's what makes rates go up and down and that's one of the biggest things that I, what we do is we try to preach and one of the things i agree um what louis was saying about you know making sure that you build in relationships and building your own relationships so that you don't have to rely on spot market freight now i won't say that there aren't any great broker relationships because even as a smaller carrier, a broker can help you grow your business. If you have the right partnership and develop the right relationships with that broker, y'all have great conversations and y'all build trust together, a good broker will help you grow your business, scale your business out. And true, when you think about any business, right? Any business is gonna have some sort of outsourcing, right? You're gonna outsource something. And in the beginning, mm -hmm. especially as a new carrier, when you outsource the expertise and you build a relationship with a broker that you can trust, and that will help you learn the business, help you learn, and, and eventually you will be able to secure your own shippers and your own freight. But it's a lot to that equation. You got to provide great service. You got to provide great communication. You got to be transparent. You got to be on time. It's, it's a lot of things that goes into that. And you got to maintain safety. But, you know, I agree that, that there is a need to make sure that we facilitate a great relationship so that way you can start building your own shipper network, your own, your own network there. Um, but a good broker will help you grow your business just as much. It's weird before we dive into Mike kind of giving us an insight on the petition and a background and telling us more about that. I want to go back to this big carrier setting the rates only because I'm a little uneducated in this area. Um, I, okay, stupid Cassandra. I always, honestly, I always thought that shippers and the brokers were the ones that truly were setting the rates because whenever I worked or was around or consulted for a broker, they were always using the small carriers um, because and shippers wanted that because they were cheaper, um, and I thought that that played a big role in the market and not as much the big carriers. And I saw somewhere in here Andrew Teal, um, Amanda brought it to my attention. Andrew Teal said, "If only nine percent of the carriers are large, how do they really set rates?" Ah, thank you. Oh my God, Zeke, you're awesome. Uh, how do they really set rates given volume? Largest carriers haul probably less than fifteen percent of the freight means the rest is set by small carriers. That's what I was thinking too, Andrew. Could do any of you guys have any insight on this point? Uh, so so let me let me let me make it a like a practical example. If four of us, right, if there's there's a load that the ship has and all four of us have independent carriers and we call on that particular load and I turn the load down, Mike turns the load down, Cassandra turns the load down, and Louis turns the load down. The next time that shipper puts that load on a load board, if he got four people that already turned that load down and he's got to move that freight, guess what he's going to have to do? He's going to have to raise the rate and make it more appealing. So the fact that we're actually rejecting that tender is what's going to push that rate up. 
Now, if all four of us just or three or four of us jumped on it, then obviously that's going to that's going to lower the demand for the cost of that that particular transaction, that particular shipment. Tender rejections has a huge, huge impact on outbound rates. It's not just not just the larger carriers; it's overall rejections as a whole. Uh, Louis, what do you think about all this? I, I think that's on the spot market as well, for sure. I agree with that. But as far as contractual rates and stuff, that's where your big carriers get a lot of freight. And then I don't know what the percentage is. Our foundation would have that, which I know doesn't help right now. But it, we do have some really where, yes, the small carriers make up way more, but the large carriers haul way more volume just because there's so many, they have so many more trucks. You know, once big carrier has 20 some thousand trucks, so, you know, our guys has one. Makes sense. So how did we get to giving Mike a chance? How do we get to this point where um, folks came to you and said, hey, we need to go to the FMCSA. We need to, if I paraphrase this improperly, I apologize. We want to have the ability to know what brokers are being paid by the shippers. So we want to see these rates. We want to see these transactions for the loads that are run. Was, is that how, like, how did that all come about? And did I paraphrase that properly? Well, so um, actually this goes back a long time. Um, I remember listening to a conversation. Um, it was recorded, but uh, between our longtime president, Jim Johnston, and uh, Bob Voltman, who is, what was the longtime president of the Transportation Intermediaries Association, uh, this was back in 2005. And had I not known what year it was, um, it, it's the same issues being discussed now. Um, so look, it really came to a head uh, in April and May of this year, for the most part, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, rates just fell off a cliff. Um, some of the per mile rates that we were seeing were uh, below a buck, uh, you know, there were 75 cents. It was almost unheard of. Um, and the impact on our members and, and non-members was was crazy. And not to say that there was an impact to brokers, because we know there was. Um, but there was a big, um, basically a big uh, protest, if you will, in D.C. Uh, back in May that lasted a number of weeks, got the attention of the administration, some folks in Congress. And uh, really was a successful uh, uh, trip to D.C. for those who made it. So um, this is not a new issue. Our petition, uh, yeah, it was filed in, in, in May, but these issues go back decades. Uh, and I'm sure we'll probably get into some of the legislative and regulatory history. But, uh, you know, again, nothing new. Um, it was, was really prompted by the coronavirus rates just falling off a cliff in April and May. But, um, you know, this would be an issue regardless of that. Really? Yeah. Okay, so. And, and I'll explain that if you want me to. Yeah, definitely. So uh, pe people are going to hate this, but look, we, uh, OYDA, we're not a fan of regulation. Um, we <laughs> we have plenty of battles to, uh, to, to say that. And um, But what I will say is the regulation is there. If brokers don't like it, they can go about changing it. There's a process to do that through Congress, through FMCSA. Um, that hasn't happened. And we can talk about the, the, you know, the ICC and how they predated FMCSA. Uh, look, I appreciate legislative and regulatory intent as much as anybody going back 30, 40 years. I've seen assumptions made about what the intent was of that regulation, but I've never, nobody's ever connected those dots for me. So, um, we would welcome information people have that would show some sort of legislative or, or regulatory intent from 30, 40 years ago. I've not seen it. I've, I've, I've seen that referenced. I've seen some mm -hmm. obscure uh, federal statutes referenced. But uh, looking at the regulation itself, we think it's pretty clear. Um, I don't think FMCSA is going to do a whole lot. Uh, Congress, maybe not. No. Uh, my guess is this plays out in the courts. Okay, so I don't. Here's the thing is from a legal perspective, I'll send you, I forgot to send you the material. I'll also send you a video. Five months ago, I did a video on rate transparency. I actually did a video when when the folks went to DC. Um, to the rest, at least to my followers and to the world I was in, the DC thing seemed a little ridiculous um, because it was a lot of screaming and a lot of uh, arguments that were unfounded by the by the law, and so it was it was hard to it was very hard for me to swallow the whole thing. I understood where the I understood where people were coming from and that they're frustrated with the rates, 
um, and I'll send you the video as well, but I went through the legislative intent and many attorneys who came on the FMCSA listening session said the same thing that I said in my video, which is it wasn't the legislative intent to allow transparency into the shippers rates in this manner. And then the second part to that was it was the legislature's, le legislature's intention to allow contracts to override this regulation. So not, to me, I think the legislative intent argument is a loser argument, a losing argument. However, uh, that's just me. Who the hell, what the hell do I know these days, uh, especially these days? However, how about today and moving forward? What do we want moving hey, Cassandra, forward? Let me, let, me take a, let me take a quick stab at that. So um, let me offer up another thing. You know, we've heard that shippers have non-disclosure agreements with brokers, right? That's yeah. a lot of broker shipper agreements. Uh, our issue with that is that's effectively allowing a third party not regulated by FMCSA to, uh, you know, effectively exempt themselves from a longstanding regulation. So um, our members can't hide behind non-disclosure agreements with any party to exempt themselves from any regulation. So um, from a precedent perspective, this is interesting to see what FMCSA will do about it. Uh, that, that's essentially what is happening, or that's one of the loopholes uh, that we think brokers are using, is hiding behind a, a non-disclosure agreement between a shipper and a broker. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. What I'm saying is that the regulation would, would require something different, in our opinion. And that's why I said earlier, if people don't like the regulation, um, go try to change it. But our interpretation of it um, is a pretty, it's a pretty simplistic view. I mean, we think that if you're a party to the transaction, in this case, a carrier, um, that you're privy to this information. Right or wrong, that's what the regulation says in our opinion. And brokers, just to add, brokers can use the same non-disclosure agreements with carriers to hide what and they, they hand off to the carrier. And they should. And they um, should, by all means. Yeah, and they do. I would say that regulations... The re regulations, especially this 49 CFR Part 370, all of those regulations that have to do with cargo claims, cargo claim processing, there's a whole mess of them that address when uh, you have to pay for freight charges. All of those can be altered by contract and waived, and you can put that in an NDA. So if they are altered, no one can know about it. So if the shippers alter them or the brokers, they can keep that confidential. So it is pretty fluent in a lot of different parts of the regulations. Um, moving forward though, when you guys were going for this petition, what were you hoping would like, do you, did you have carriers actually come to you and say, I want to see, um, how much this broker is paying this sh is being paid by the shipper and what would they do with that information? How would it, how would it benefit them? Yeah, we've had carriers and members and everything ask us for this kind of information for years. Also, another thing that we, it's not really been brought up, but we see it here almost on a daily basis, is we have a lot of brokers that a driver will deliver a load, he'll have a clean bill of lading, and then he'll go to get a payoff a week or two later, and they'll take $500 from him and say there's a claim on the load. They won't provide any kind of paperwork or documentation or anything saying what that claim was. Our drivers got a signed clean bill of lading from that shipper, mm -hmm. but now all of a sudden there's this claim, but nobody, and it's always an even number. You know, I, I just have a real hard time finding it. Every claim's five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, an even number. Yeah, that to me is a dick move. Why don't they file against the bond? Well, this is them filing against the carrier themselves, our dry, or you know, the broker taking money from our carrier. So the carrier can't file against the broker's bond. They got uh, a carrier certainly can file against a, a broker's bond. That raises a whole uh, <laughs> that raises other issues in and of itself with uh, the, the you know what is now a seventy five thousand dollar bond. But um, we have you can rack up five hundred thousand dollars in claims against a broker's seventy five thousand dollar bond. That happens all the time, and carriers get paid pennies on the dollar when that happens. So. The claims process when you file on a bond is broken. Uh, there's virtually no oversight from FMCSA on that. The National Consumer Complaint Database That's does not true. work. So uh, there, there's other issues when you're talking about filing on a bond that you know maybe we can't even get into in this 
uh, this hour. At some point in time, we should, though. We, we should. should have, and, I, stuff. And, and I think that leads back to what you said earlier, where you didn't quite fully understand why truckers are down there in Washington a few months ago upset. Yeah, that was weird. Well, I think that it comes down to because truckers are just tired of it, I feel. You know, every regulation, all these rules they have to follow, it seems like they're on the bottom of the totem pole every single time. It rolls down on them, and they, there's no oversight there. They get no protection. They get no transparency. You know, you can only take so much. And, yeah. you know, when, when, the, when you're not even making any more money now, you can't even afford to pay your bills or feed your family, that causes for drastic things. Do they all ha was everything handled the way it should be? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I know we're not here, but, but I think that's what drives people to do that. Yeah, I let think me, we see that not only in trucking, but in a lot of things in the world. Cassandra, let me let me also add too. Um, I think what most people would probably agree that there's a gray area on this issue. Um, you know, whatever the, the historical intent was behind this, what the regulation says now. Um, Quite honestly, it would be nice if Congress and or from CSA addressed this or provided cl some clarification one way or the other on it. Um, I think they need to. Um, certainly from our perspective, historically, what our members have seen, when, when we look at the regulation and what it requires, uh, in the real world, if you try to get that information, it's virtually impossible. Um, carrier, uh, brokers might make you come into their facility. So if you're a carrier in Florida, and the brokers in California, it's very unlikely that you're going to get out there anytime soon. Um, you may be able to review it. They're not going to send you a copy of it. Uh, we actually, when we were looking at this earlier this year, we sent a lot of information out to our members asking for, uh, for some feedback. And I can't tell you how many carriers we had that said, you know what, we would love to see this information. We, we agree with the regulation, but um, we're not going to request it for fear of retaliation. And we know I have email copies of retaliation from brokers against carriers for requesting that information. So that happens. You get blacklisted. We know okay. it happens. There's proof of that. So either way, FMCSA should clean this up. Interesting. These are these are points I didn't think about. Adam, what are you thinking this whole time? So, you know, obviously I, I represent the both, you know, right down in the middle in terms of, you know, we represent carriers and trying that carriers are operating properly and, and, and compliant. At the same time, we want to represent what's right and what's feasible in the situation. And one of the things that I believe is that information that's pertinent to a shipment should be transparent, you know, period. So whether mm -hmm. that's your safer, whether that's safer data to where you, you can detail whether or not the carrier has a, uh, has a great safer score, their out service rates, things like that should be transparent during the shipment. How much a broker makes is where I have questions in terms of, if you look back at it, you know, just to, to Mike's point and what he was mentioning, my biggest concern is that what are you going to do with the information, right? What, how is that information going to benefit you as a carrier? Now, if I look at it one hand, yeah. Okay. We could look at it from a standpoint. Okay. Could there be gouging in there, you know, somewhere in there? Could, could it be something that it could be some, some serious trust issues so some antitrust issues? The thing that I worry about is that when when we discuss broker transparency to, to, to the level is, as I don't believe that lumping all brokers in one bucket uh, is the right thing to do because it could be potentially inflammatory to the industry because it's the same rhetoric that can be used for carriers. If you look at out of service rates right now, 20% of the carriers that are moving throughout Thank the country you, are out of service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you think about that, we got to look at it, you know, on both sides of the coin. So, you know, when you talk about out of service, it's a variety of whether it's vehicle maintenance, private fitness for duty, hours of service. There's a variety of things that kind of go down into it. So my my thing is, is that I don't know if broker transparency in terms of what we are seeing will solve the issue. However, I do believe that the language shouldn't be hidden all the way down at the bottom of page 16 on the carrier packet. You know, perhaps that thing needs to be at the very top on the front of the of page one. I believe that that needs to be said. Hey, you know what? You sign this carrier packet. You're signing with this NDA. My biggest thing is that I really want our carriers, you know, when I look at it, I really want our carriers to be transparent with, with, with their own business operations. Learn the business operations and dig deep, deep into that business operation because, you know, the thing about it is, is that at the end of the day, whether or not that broker is making 15% or 30%, it's not going to change the rate that's on the load. And it's gonna, yeah. that's not going to change the, the impact on that load. I still have to make, I, that load needs to still, like I think Louis said, that load still needs to put food on my table. 
So whether or not that information is given, I don't know. I, I really, you know, I don't think that if it was a top 10 issues for me in trucking, that wouldn't be one of them. Louis, what do you think about that? Because I'm, I'm with him like, all right, you got the information. Because uh, we have to set aside cargo claims and the aftermath type of thing. Because when I saw your petition, it wasn't about that stuff. It was more about the shippers' rates. So they get so the carrier gets visibility into the shippers. And you can tell me if I'm wrong, Mike. I could be wrong. They get visibility into the shippers' rates. And they see that the broker just got 40% markup. Now what are we doing? Do we just know, like, okay, this broker just ripped me off. I'm going to go work with another one. Is that what you guys are going for? Or that, um I, 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 yeah. I'm a little ignorant here, so that's the only reason why I'm not drawing the connection. Well, I mean, that's just it. I mean, the brokers, they have lots of information at their fingertips on how to choose carriers and the right carriers and stuff like that. Truckers virtually have nothing. Nothing. Brokers. That's brokers. actually very true. And, and that's just it. We don't believe that they should get the information up front like some have asked for. We believe that we're all with the regulation once it's over. So, yes, that I agree that truckers need to know their cost of operation. They need to be well transparent in their business. But, you know, they need something, some sort of protection to help them know. I mean, what would this done for us in, back in May when everybody was down in Iran? Well, we would know whether brokers were really – ripping people off or they weren't ripping people off. I'm not saying either way. Cause I don't know what, the, you know, we have a somewhat of idea. I'm sure rates yeah. did drop some, but we're brokers taking advantage of the situation. I mean, a lot of brokers now are wanting you to wanting to track the trucks and track the loads and track the shipment. And Hey, I'm not speaking out as a proponent or not proponent, but I do understand why. I mean, when you order something off of Amazon or whatever, you can track it from the day it ships all the way to your door. So I, that's the kind of society we're getting into. But I guess brokers, I don't think their costs though. But brokers, I'm, ordering, can, I'm sure, I'm sure Amazon's getting a nice, beautiful chunk of profit. I don't know what it is. I'm still gonna buy it. <laughs> right, but my point is the tracking deal. Brokers can use that information. They can know whether if they're tracking where trucks are, they know whether they've got an overabundance of trucks. They have a heads up in my opinion, prior to whether they're going to have an overabundance truck scenario or not. So again, they can offer freight accordingly. Like Adam said, when people, they offer the loads, if everybody turns it down, then somewhere they know they've got to up the rate. But they've, all, they've already got extra information, and that's what we're looking for. Let's give the driver a tool where he can make some good decisions. Hey, Cassandra, Cassandra, I want to add, too, um, the regulation, I'm not going to restate it, you know, state it. Everybody knows what it is, but basically requires parties to the transaction to have information made available to them, including the amount of compensation received by the broker for the brokerage. Um, so, um, you know, that's what that's what the regulation says. What also irritates us is in. Wait, wait, wait. Are you trying to draw a link with that cargo claim point with that? No. OK, just checking. No, what I was going to say was. Um, in an overwhelming majority, uh, <laughs> in an overwhelming majority <laughs> of, uh, of broker um, broker carrier contracts that we see, there's always a provision in there that requires the carrier to waive its rights to 371.3. We see that yes. language almost it's everywhere. And again, this practically is practically malpractice if an attorney. It is, and, and, and this is this is an interesting legal question: is uh, you know, can they actually do that if there's a federal regulation? Can a regulated entity basically exclude themselves or exempt themselves from it by requiring, in this case, a carrier to waive their rights to it? So think about the precedent from, you know, it, it doesn't. My, and the my, answer is yes, Mike. It's a rhetorical question because you can't do that. Uh, in this case, but you can. Is 49 USC 14501 allows us to do all of that. In this case, a, a federal regulation. You, you can't exempt yourself from a federal. You just can't. It, the, the they allow it. They say it in writing. You are allowed to contract around this regulation. No, they that, say it about forty nine uh, UF uh, CFR Part three seventy two. Is that between brokers and shippers or it brokers doesn't, and carriers? It, it doesn't. It doesn't even matter. Because I think there's. A, I think there's a distinction in there between brokers and shippers and brokers and carriers. But I don't know. Hold on. Um. Let's just at least look at forty nine USC. 15 or the 14. 14501. 
Contract. So, give me one second to scan on down through this. Intermediaries. All right, we'll have to resolve this contract. We'll have to resolve this. I'll put this in the comments for you guys and Mike, Mike will respond to. We'll keep it going in either the YouTube comments or whatnot. So to keep the, I'm, I'm sure Mike and I are the only ones who are truly interested in like the law and the intent and everyone else is like, okay, Cassandra, carry it on, carry it on. Um, so so uh, here we go. So I wanna go to, wait, how much time do I have? Sweet, I have plenty, okay. So I wanna go to uh, the hearing the FMCSA had like a public hearing, which I thought was pretty cool um, and allowed people to come forth and talk about their thoughts and da, da, da. I noticed that you didn't, you didn't have a lot of carriers come on. And I, I, I recognize and understand the retaliation point, um, even though you could call in anonymously. Do you think now that rates are really good for carriers, they're not as driven right now for this transparency? Or are they still yes. emailing and calling you guys ready to go pitchforks I, I think it swings as a pendulum you know when it gets bad in trucking and when rates go down then then the behavior swing and and it's not a celebration it's a hey we need to go find out you know who's mm -hmm. who's ripping us off but when the rates are up then you see all the facebook posts the instagram posts the rate cons and how much they're making and and the, and the fact of the matter is is that and i don't know maybe 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 they, maybe mike and lou do get as many many complaints but you do not hear the chatter amongst the industry, as you heard back in May, uh, I, I just feel like it's just, it's, just a, it's just a pattern of behavior that happens when rates go back and forth. But we all know that rates are cyclical. Like, you know, it's just a pendulum. The further you swing a pendulum back, the, the harder it's gonna come back in the other direction. We saw rates talk, take, a, take a really t big tank back in April and May, but now we're seeing rates we haven't seen since 2018. Like, so it's, it's, it's just part of the cycle. And that's one of the things that I believe that we, we have to do a better job in the industry of preparing people for the cycle of, of, of the economy. Trucking is a big part of the economy, and we do see these cycles. Um, but I, I just think that now the chatter from, from the carriers that we deal with, so we talk to anywhere between, you know, I don't know, thousands of uh, different carriers, that's not the message right now. The, the message isn't that. You know, the message now is, hey, I can't find trucks and trailers. Um, Another key point of supply demand. Yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, you're 100% correct. And, you know, drivers, um, when things are bad, they complain. When they're making some money, they're busy out trucking and they don't make money. Or they're, they're you know, they're not complaining, I guess. I'm sorry. And, I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, that's where a lot of times these comment periods, I mean, we see that here in our office. We try, try to get members to comment and stuff, and we can't stress enough how important it is that they do comment but I just think that's part of the problem. Our guys, you know, they don't have any government people. I mean, I guess we're their government people, for lack of, you know, they don't have any internal. It's just one guy, one truck, one trailer. But mm -hmm. if they're out making a living, sometimes it's kind of hard for them to file these comments, make these listening sessions. Sometimes these things are a little confusing for us who are in an office to try to get a hold of and make comments, let alone some guy out on the road trying to make it from do it with a cell phone. Yeah. Mike, you want to add anything? I love, sorry, Mike, I got to intro for one second. Next Exit Logistics. Uh, by the way, you guys, this is Chandler, one of my best friends. Um, he says, I have shipments that put food on the table, and I have shipments that take the food, table, chairs, cups, plates away. <laughs> I love this point because um, I have so many friends that say something similar, and I saw Ron Kane was saying that from a shipper perspective as well, which is we have times where we are losing our shirts, and we have times where we're making it up. Um, and there are and there are fluctuations in in these uh, scenarios. How would the visibility allow truckers to to balance that um, that volatility? Yeah, well, a couple. Let me just uh, to go back a little bit. Um, this issue doesn't die down for us uh, just because rates go back up. 
um, we're going to see this through the end, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and and like I said earlier, it's something that FMCSA needs to address. Uh, needs to address. We can debate uh, legislative intent all we want, but uh, until we actually have something in writing from FMCSA uh, or some sort of you know uh, legal ruling on this, then we really don't know. Uh, that's what we're looking for, and I think that's what some of the. I think I would say that brokers probably want that now. Um, we know that brokers don't like this regulation, uh, so let's either you know let, let's address it in some way, and I, it, it's got to be addressed. This has been going on for way too long. We have um, another twenty minutes. I want to talk about uh, and and for those of oh shoot, Amanda Miller. I'm sorry, I got so engrossed. Um, that Amanda sent me questions and I got so engrossed that I didn't even see. So let me make sure that I'm getting you guys the questions from people. Um, let's see. Oh, Jolly already asked the question that I did. So Jolly and I are on like the same um, point. Tough question so far. Let's see. What I okay. I think I'm covering everything. Okay. Laszlo. This was a good question, Laszlo. Um, what is your what is your position, or what would it be um, if the FMCSA does modify the rule how you've request? Whoa, Zeke, you're fast. Um, and well, I'll just read it off the screen. Uh, modifies the rule by uh, by not requiring the broker to reveal their revenue on the load. What would you do if the FMCSA modifies the rule by not requiring the broker broker to reveal the revenue on the load? Well, I'll, let me answer this. Um, it would seem like FMCSA wouldn't have to do that since brokers' interpretation is that they can either exempt themselves from the regulation or a longstanding statute exempts them anyway. So It's not the uh, interpretation. It actually says it. I'm going to find uh, that shit and I'm going to post it. I, I want, but my point is, if that's true, why would FMCSA have to change anything? They're not changing anything. So that's my point to that question. It's, it's almost impossible uh, to answer. What We would oppose it, absolutely, but... Uh, at the end of the day, if that's what FMCSA does, we would have to move on. What would you guys feel about if there was a complete transparency? Like FMCSA came to you guys and they said, all right, because here's here's what the change would be to the rule. The change would be one more sentence, which would be you cannot waive this regulation by contract or remove the language that says regu that they're allowed to uh, waive this requirement by contract. So that's what it would be. What if the FMCSA said to you guys, all right, we're going to allow um, this regulation and it's not going to be allowed to be waived by contract, which means that carriers have visibility into the financial transactions of these shipments. But in exchange, carriers have to make their rates public. Do you guys remember back in the day, like household good carriers and some of the tariff carriers made their rates public? Um, what would you guys think about that if there was like a tit for tat kind of Mike, can FMCSA even do that now that there's deregulation? Louis, this is uh, yeah, such a uh, hypothetical. This is, this is hypothetical. Why, um, <laughs> Why does he always have to be the smart one? <laughs> All right. Look, that, Magic tough, wand. It, it, it's a tough question to answer. I, you know, um, hypothetically, I, you know, I really don't know. It, it's that's unlikely to happen. Uh, there's, it's, it's more likely that this issue will be clarified one way or the other, either for or against our position. That was a good dodge, Mike. Um, okay. and look, you know, and, and why not? I, you know, uh, I, I see a lot of the questions over there. And, and um, uh, again, I still would, would challenge. Um, I like Jake's question. Did you yeah. see that? Want to go back to the government regulated industry? Do you, what is OIDA's position? Did you guys like it back before the industry was deregulated? Like, do you guys, I, I clearly do not know. Look, Mike's like done with this interview. Yeah, like Mike, he fell off. <laughs> He's like, screw her. She's, at, she's challenging me on the law. I hate her. I'll leave Louie to answer this question. <laughs> um, so, oh, thank you. Oh, my goodness. I love having help. Uh, so so the question um, was, would you guys like to go back to the where what it was before deregulation? Um, well, in my opinion, the only thing that's changed since deregulation is rates aren't regulated and tariffs aren't regulated. Everything else about the, this is the most regulated, deregulated industry, in my opinion. <laughs> so, I mean, other than regulation of rates and tariffs, what's changed? That's so true. 
Um, okay, I'm gonna want to. I want to talk about uh, one more thing that's actually the most important thing, and why I wanted you on here, besides a better understanding behind this transparency push, which is what else can we come together with on an indus as an industry, or what else is on your agenda for regulation change, if anything at all? Are you because I I haven't been paying attention to what else you guys are working on where you promote. So I do. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things that if if it was a magic world for me is mm -hmm. would be it is way too easy to get a motor carrier uh number these it's days way uh, too easy it's way too easy and, and way, too, sorry, you know, broker, it's like, way too easy to get broker authority too and same thing it's way too easy there's no there's no onboarding process there's no safety requirement so here get this so i get an mc right I'm happy along. I can have less than a year experience behind the wheel. Get my MC. I'm hyping along down the highway. Nine months down, later, I get a letter mail saying, "Hey, it's time for my safety." Audit. It kind of reminds me if I, if we were all to get into an airplane today, right? And we walk in, and the captain comes on the board and says, "Hey, you know what? Thank you for <laughs> the flying gains airlines. We have not got a safety audit yet. We'll probably have one in the next nine months." So. You Feel free to, to, to stay on board. We're going to be safe. It's way too easy. But right? you see, so, a plane's going to be super cheap. It's probably going to be. Well, I mean, we don't know that. We don't know that. <laughs> but, Couldn't help but it. The thing about, <laughs> but the thing about that, the thing about that is, is that it's so backwards. Why aren't we putting up? And then when you think about it's a, a root cause to insurance issue, right? So talking about the the, the insurance height, you know, the, the, the GL height from 750 to proposed 2 million, whatever that is. But there is, where's the safety programs that's going to put us in better position so where we can defend that? Like, like half of the carriers that get in have no fleet safety programs. So I don't, and so if there's any regulations in, in, in my eyes that needs to be a focus on, we've got to do a better job of ensuring that the motoring carrier, the motoring public is safe by making sure our motor carriers are in order. Because a lot of times what we see is that we see a lot of these nuclear verdicts happening as a result, poor hours of service. When I'm looking at people at ELDs and doing ELD reviews, you should see some of the heartbreaks that you'll see. You should see some of the speeding violations that happen. And these are some folks that have not been in the business for three, four months. And you got drivers going up and down the highway at 80 miles an hour. I'm like, you know, really, we've got to do a better job at having a standardized process in order to get that MC issue, just like getting a driver's license. It was harder for me to get my driver, my CDL license than it was for me to get an MC number. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was harder and for me I to get a driver's license. Isn't that amazing? And I think to flip that so that Louie and Mike have another hypothetical situation, because Mike loves hypotheticals like they're his favorite. Um, <laughs> Which is, would you guys, would you guys support a OIDA or potentially think in your heart so you'd be behind a, a bill like that that was presented that said, had some more requirements for carriers to get authority, had some more kind of hoops to jump through, but in exchange, it's going to be the same shit for brokers too. Because right now, I, I do think we need to reduce the brokers. When I hear Louie telling me stories, and I do, you guys, I do see a lot of, the brokers are not watching this show oh no look i'm stressing louis out look i gave him a headache <laughs> <laughs> sorry man <laughs> um, so uh, it, to make the standards higher for the brokers to become a broker too it can't just be like this overnight thing and you know you've got a lot of you could people's lives you're working these truck drivers whatever anyhow would you guys support something like that or be or be interested in hearing more about that in this hypothetical magical wand land yeah, I mean, if something like that came about, I mean, I agree with Adam. I think we all agree with Adam. It's way too easy to get a DOT number. There is no checks. I mean, it's kind of sad that you can, you know, buy a DOT number and then you can be fined out of existence six, um, a year later just because you didn't understand what you were getting yourself into. I mean, I, I, whether you know or don't know here at OIDA, that's one of the services that we do provide is that we will help people get their authority. Um we try to painstakingly go through the process with them and explain that this isn't for everyone. Make sure you, you know, a lot of guys get in this business, they don't even have any money or credit, unfortunately. Yeah. And oh, by and, the way, often they get ripped off with this whole leasing truck program too. That's a whole other thing. Lease purchase, say, I'd love to do a mm -hmm. show about lease purchase. Okay. It's something that near and dear to my heart that I hate, but, but you're, you're exactly, Adam's exactly correct. I mean, it, the, the system's backwards. Um, we started here, kind of, I guess, by my direction, keeping track of the guys who file for authority. Where are they a year from now? 
reach back out to the authority, you know, and of course we can only reach out to the people that we get authority for. And, you know, there's about a 30 to 40% m monthly that get their authority and 30 to 40% a year from now, they're no longer in business. Either they've went out of business, they've had a problem, maybe they've released a carrier, you know, there's different things. Again, that's part of the reason we started our truck to success course and stuff like that, because this is a tough business. And, you know, I always say there's no trucking for dummies or getting your DOT for dummies out there. Mike, how achievable is something like that? Uh, or have you guys ever tried to, to have the barriers raised for motor carriers or for brokers? Um, just well, not to interest for Mike, but we haven't tried yet. But we have done some in-house stuff and come up with some in-house ideas to possibly push moving forward. And go ahead, Mike. I mean, to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't really have much to add other than there is no real barrier to entry. Uh, it's very easy to get a CDL, very easy to get your, um, you know, get a DOT number, get your own authority. Uh, maybe you go through new intro audit at some point, uh, depending on which state you're in and how aggressively they actually do it, do that stuff. You know, on the brokerage side, I'm, I'm less familiar with that. There's, it doesn't appear to be uh, many barriers to entry on the brokerage side. And I think there are probably tens of thousands you of them. Insurance. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the other points, there are plenty of carriers that we would never, um, uh, there are plenty of bad carriers out there. Uh, and I think one of the things that's missed is uh, we always assume that every, you know, not every carrier is good and not every broker is good. Uh, so some of the transparency requirements that are in, uh, that are in place uh, you know, maybe some of the better brokers shouldn't have to deal with that stuff, but there are plenty of bad brokers that really make some of that necessary. So uh, would OYDA do anything with the information? No, uh, the carriers would. Uh, we're not a party to that transaction. We wouldn't request it. We, we wouldn't, okay. We wouldn't I was actually going to add so, that. Um, but but again, it would be pretty smart, Mike, if the OI, if OIDA, I'm sorry, I have to say OIDA, I've been saying it for 10 yeah. years. I'm sorry. Uh, tell your president, I apologize uh, for many other things. My attitude too. I usually have to apologize for that too. But um, th that was one of the questions I was thinking in my head. I'm like, damn, OIDA could have a survey out to all these carriers, do something electronically so they could collect all this information. If they had, you know, that's like a big chunk of information that you could have access to and have reporting on. Uh, could not a... Uh could not a, a, a broker include a non-disclosure agreement in their broker carrier contract to prohibit said carrier from disclosing rates to anybody? Yes, Mike. Nice, nice plug. Nice. I love that. <laughs> I think you'll stay on camera a little bit longer now. So, <laughs> there was somebody else who had a super good question. Hold on, you guys. I'm sorry. It was Butter. He's got a better face for radio than he does camera. And all <laughs> oh, yes. I love this. Look at him. Look at him. Um, and uh, Omar, oh, what does Omar have? Okay, I've given loads to carriers by making twenty six fifty. I think that's a negative. And being a broker, does it feel like ripping? And it is not only one load that I'm talking about. There were loads that I'd have to give by making losses. Yeah, if I share that information with the carrier, will they be able to do that load for me on Eden? Does anybody have a response to that, or should we go on to buttered bread? I know there was a butter break. I, I, look, let, let me just say this. Um, we, we've talked to brokers. We have brokers that are members of ours. Um, we know that brokers lose money on loads. That happens. All the time. Uh, we know that shippers, um, uh, when it's economically advantageous for shippers, they'll come in and try to renegotiate previously uh, contracted rates with a broker. That happens. There are, um, you know, it, it's not like we're, saying that brokers have the best of everything and, and they don't have any issues to deal with. Um, we're more focused on this exact, this specific regulation, what we see as longstanding loopholes to basically avoid it. Uh, and the fact that there is a gray area, right? Um, we could sit here and tell our faces all turn red, you know, but the bottom line is there's a huge dispute among brokers, shippers, carriers, FMCSA lawmakers as to what this regulation says. Um, which goes back to my earlier point is it needs to be cleaned up one way or another. So, uh, but again, I, we're not sitting here saying that, um, you know, I have a, a family member who's a, uh, what I call a dispatcher for a broker, but you know, she's on the phones all day trying to get loads. And I, I talked to her and she told me how it works and, and how they lose money on a regular basis. And you know. shippers, will, uh, shippers will renegotiate, uh, you know, long-term rates with brokers when it, again, when it makes sense for them to do that, whereas brokers really don't have much leverage to do that if the shoe was on the other foot. So, 
Um, we get it. You know, uh, our members rely on brokers just as much as brokers rely on our members. So um, there's a relationship here. And, and it's not like, um, yeah, we disagree on this issue, uh, but it's not the end of the world. It'll work out. And really, in the scheme of things, um, for people that we disagree with in D.C., uh, we have a lot more disagreements with, with other industries than we do with TIA and its members or non-members. I would just like to point out that truckers lose money on loads as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to point out one more thing, you guys, just one more thing, because I'm constantly hearing this, but is it is, I, I get, and I love that Louis, Louis led with some of the, the shit kind of rolling downhill toward truckers often, which can be quite true. But lately I would like you to know that brokers have been bearing the brunt, sorry shippers, but brokers have been bearing the brunt of being the insurance company of the industry, of being the cargo claim payments for the industry, of being the banks because shippers don't want to pay. They want, they don't want to pay quickly, but they've got to pay the, but brokers got to pay the carriers quickly. So there's like a lot of headache in there too. So you're not the only ones that are feeling like the shit rolling downhill um we have just to be clear just to be clear we and i think mike said this once we realize there are good brokers out there lots of good brokers i think brokers probably a lot of times are like truckers you get in law enforcement and everything the bad 10 percent a lot of times get way more airplay and way more credit than the good 90 percent you know some of this transparency stuff that we're talking would probably help some brokers too, because some of these unscrupulous brokers are hurting other brokers' businesses as well, and could actually possibly raise the, the bar and raise the money for the good brokers, because it would get these, you know, fly by night or unscrupulous brokers out of business, out of the system, which would help everyone, us and the brokers, which is what we'd like to see. Yeah. Um, my Adam. Do you yes. have any other, um, if you had your magic wand, is there anything else we're missing in this discussion of things that Mike, Mike just loves this, of magical wand, let's put more work on Mike's plate um, and more headaches of things that we can come together as an industry for uh, and now, promote. I, 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 think, I think we have to come together with a common voice uh, at some point. Uh, you know, and I think that one of the points that, that Mike was saying, it's, it's, it's so much... Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of things lost in interpretation in this industry. You got, you know, one side saying this reads this way. You have another side saying it reads that way. I think that there's a lot of things that we have to clean up. I think that, you know, the FMSC said they need to get involved, um, you know, with some of the things that we just talked about, you know, like from a safety perspective, the nuclear perspective, really getting to the bottom line and really getting down to the root cause of these things. Because if we, we have to come to a common place to start. Right. So we got to come into a common place where we all agree that, hey, you know what, if we can start here and build upon that, then I think it'll build better conversations. I think it'll build better, better synergy. And I think it'll give us more leverage so that we can have more fruitless discussions on things that are not so clear to us as an industry. But right now, uh, you know, just like, you know, to Mike's point, we are over the same stuff we've been arguing over for the last 20 years. And we're getting absolutely nowhere with it. We've got to do yeah, something different. We've got to look different. We've got to act differently. Maybe that's, maybe that's not the hill we want to die on right now. Let's pick something else to, to, to really bark up. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, what else? Am I missing anything else, you guys? And I'll let this no, thing wrap just, up. That, there, you know, there is agreement on uh, barriers to issue, uh, barriers to entry and, and the, the nuclear verdicts. That impacts trucking just as much as it does everybody else. We, yeah, uh, tort reform is a huge priority for ours, not only in D.C., but on a state level uh, in, in a number of states that we've joined state chambers of commerce or work with state trucking associations, other, uh, you know, state legislative interests that, that you know, that, that's a, a tort reform is a huge issue. I, there are also, so we're going to disagree on a few things. Uh, clearly, this is one of them. But uh, again, back to what Adam just said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's time for FMCSA to clean this up one way or another. So, you know, another 15 years from now, we're not still here talking about. I know. That would be so, that would suck. We'd, oh. we'd make fun of Louie this time, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question, though. Uh, you brought something up. And the, on, oh, why does pri like, top priorities with legislative in the legislative context is the transparency is that the top priority is tort reform the top priority or is the barrier to entry which one is like your top priority right now legislatively not, none of the above uh that's more of a as we see it right now is more of an issue with the federal agency uh and potentially the courts than it than it will have anything to do with congress um and if 
anybody's waiting on Congress to do anything, um, don't hold your breath because uh, it likely won't happen. So our, we have other real, uh, you know, our, our priorities are elsewhere on the legislative side of things. But if I had to rank this, I mean, this is a top five or top 10 priority for us, whether it's going to be with FMCSA, Congress, the courts. And this is a huge issue for our members, and um, we're, we're going to see it through the end one way or another. Okay. Um, all right. You guys were brave coming on here. And uh, Mike, we're going to continue this debate uh, that bores everybody else and that infuriates each of us. Cassandra, I'm serious. You should um, send me. I will. Let me, I know we're out of time, but um, there was an issue I worked on for a number of years where I had to go back to, I, we talked about this yesterday, back to the early and mid 80s, looking at regulatory filings and comments and, and uh, actually the regulatory history on an issue. So I appreciate that. I know that this is uh, that that uh, there are a lot of people. We may disagree on on that history, but send me what you have. I will look at it absolutely. I have planned. Connect the dots for me. Connect the dots. I, I will, or or you connect them for me. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, Adam. Need, yeah, I love this. Adam Cassandra needs to have Adam back for a program. Um, I want to give you guys a heads up. I am doing December fourth. I'm going to do an episode on hours of service um, because you guys know there's been some changes. Um, Folks now who have decided that they've got to be compliant with hours of service because of the ELDs, now they we're hearing a lot of screaming about the hours of service and how it doesn't work. Um, it's too inflexible. So I want to have a show about that. You guys are welcome back. Adam, you included. Anybody else who wants to join me for because uh, December 4th? Because I want to talk. We're going to talk with a leading attorney about the changes. And then we're going to talk about what can we do as an industry to improve these regulations? Because I think a lot of people agree that they are kind of make things difficult, but we can't not have them because of accidents. And fatigue is so closely linked to death and accidents that we can't ignore it either. So Mike, I see that face. Is Mike laughing at me, Louie? I'm laughing with you. We're, yeah, we, we don't completely agree with that, but it's okay. We don't oh, have to agree. Coming back on for an hours of service episode then. <laughs> Let him go wall to wall, fucking drive 15 hour <laughs> days. <laughs> <laughs> Fatigue Actually, uh, seems to be that big catch all word that they like to use. So we don't necessarily <laughs> think that fatigue's the big problem that some people like to make it out to be. Oh my God. <laughs> Jolly said people will help people. All right. You guys are awesome. This is probably one of my favorite episodes. You're welcome back. <laughs> Number fourth, email me and let me know. Mike, uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the day now researching and battling with you because <laughs> no hey, one else. Matt, let's, let's do it, Sandra, it take a look. now you know i feel every day working with this guy i'm so sorry <laughs> but i love him <laughs> thank you and adam good luck in atlanta we appreciate having you i oh, hope people you. reach out to you if they need help uh with their training and with the profitability of their business adam is our person that we go to and now white is too so cool all right Thanks, thank you guys very nice much. to meet you adam thank nice you. to meet you too Thank we'll uh, end the broadcast. I don't have to do it.